This is CTT Live. I'm DK Rasta. Minister of National Security Stuart Young is hosting a media conference to provide an update on national security issues. We're bringing you live coverage on TTT, Talk City 91.1 FM, and on Facebook at TTT Live Online. We go to that media briefing now. Good afternoon, members of the media, wider viewing and listening public of Trinidad and Tobago. Thank you all very much for your time this afternoon in what I hope would be a fairly media conference, but an important one nonetheless. What I've come here this afternoon to discuss and to announce the launch of is our Venezuelan migrant re-registration exercise. As you all would have heard us saying over the past few weeks, and I gave it a soft opening over the weekend, the government of Trinidad and Tobago has decided and cabinet has decided that we will allow a re-registration or rather an updating of information with those Venezuelans who participated in the original Venezuelan registration of migrants scheme, which was done sometime back in 2019. As you all would recall at the time in 2019, what we had said as a government is we took a decision, a humanitarian decision really, because it's our brothers and sisters in Venezuela, all who were here in Trinidad and Tobago, whether you came in legally or illegally, come forth and register. We all know that's all history now, and we had approximately 16,500 odd Venezuelans who were registered at the time. The registration process, when we did it at a few locations, three locations, the Queen's Park Oval, a location in San Fernando, and a location in Tobago, we registered from babies all the way up to the adults in the system. We then provided, as a cabinet, we took a decision and provided an extension, a six-month extension that led to another six-month extension. Here we are now in March 2021, having navigated a pandemic for the last year and continue to do so. There were a number of things that were put into place subsequent to the last registration process of the Venezuelan migration scheme, migrants registration scheme. We introduced the Monday after a requirement for visas for Venezuelans entering Trinidad and Tobago. So for any Venezuelan wishing to enter Trinidad and Tobago, you are required to apply for a visa. That continues to be the applicable law. And then, as everyone knows, on the 22nd of March last year, we also introduced as part of our response as a government to the global pandemic and for the protection of persons in Trinidad and Tobago, we introduced a scheme where we closed the borders and managed the entry of persons into, into and out of Trinidad and Tobago. Not management, it means that persons are required to get permission to enter Trinidad and Tobago. I put that contextual background to let it be known at the outset that this re-registration exercise is not an opportunity for any persons who have illegally entered Trinidad and Tobago, any persons who don't have visas to be here in Trinidad and Tobago or Venezuelans to come forth and register now. What we're doing is we're providing the opportunity for those who originally registered and went through the system because we also had a due diligence exercise after we took the information. And there were a number of people who came up on Interpol lists. There were a number of people who had criminal records and some who decided to go back. I mean, within the past few weeks, as the Minister of National Security, I've actually canceled a number of these Venezuelan migrant registration cards of persons who have said they're, they're moving on. They're going back to Venezuela or to other countries, etc. Then, of course, those who engaged and were caught engaging in illegal and criminal activities in Trinidad and Tobago. We've had a number of deportation exercises. We've had a number of persons arrested, charged. Only a handful, but in those cases, their cards and their registration were cancelled by me as a Minister of National Security as well. So, just to let persons know, and after this conference, what we will do is we will have everything said, converted into Spanish and put up on our website and our other social media platforms. So the Venezuelans who are here, have been provided with this opportunity, will be able to hear in their own native tongue what it is we're requiring them to do. It starts next week, Monday, Monday the 8th of March, and the exercise will continue until the 26th of March. 
What we're requiring persons to do is download the forms, their Form 17A, from our website, the Ministry of National Security website. All of that information will be provided. You have to fill out the forms, their requirements to provide certain copies of certain documents, etc. And then you are to drop these off in drop boxes. We're going to have three drop boxes. This whole exercise is going to be handled by the enforcement unit of the Immigration Division. The Immigration Enforcement Offices are at number 135 Henry Street, Port of Spain, number 2 Knox Street, San Fernando, and then the Agricola Building in Scarborough, Tobago. So those are the three locations where from Monday the 8th of March until the 26th of March, there will be drop boxes. These drop boxes will be available from 7 a.m. in the morning to 4 p.m. on a daily basis for persons who are part of this re-registration scheme to drop off their sealed envelopes. I'll say in a short while what you have to put on your sealed envelopes and to put them in one of these three drop boxes. The Venezuelans who are registered themselves don't have to come and put the, the envelopes in the drop boxes. All right, Anyone can put it in the drop box. Persons who were not previously registered are not going to be allowed to be registered in this exercise. So what you have to do is on this Form 17A, you fill out your application form. You'd also provide a copy of your migrant registration card or your minister's permit, a recent passport size photo taken with a white background only, a copy of the bio data, bio, bio data page of the passport, your sed, cedular card, which is Venezuelan, my um, Venezuelan registration card, or your UNHCR card. Proof of your address in Trinidad and Tobago. Example, a rent receipt or a letter from your landlord. A job letter addressed to the Minister of National Security, which would include the company's letterhead or stamp, employee's job title, the date employed, the salary, the signature of the managing director, human resource officer, or the supervisor. If an employer is not in possession of a company letterhead stamp, a letter stating the job title. One of the purposes behind this exercise is us, for us to update the data on all of those persons who were already previously registered. So this information is critical. Then, then these, this information must be put into an envelope and sealed and put into the drop box. Now on the sealed envelope, and this is very important, this information be put on the sealed envelope. You write your full name the migrant registration card or minister's permit number, a local telephone number, and an email address on the outside of the envelope. You seal the envelope and put it in one of the drop boxes. Your name, telephone number, and an email address are critical because once we've completed the verification exercise and we're prepared now to issue you with an extension of your registration of your Venezuelan migrant registration card or your minister's permit, you will have to be contacted to come in and collect it. We remain in a pandemic. We remain very conscious of not setting up situations where persons can unnecessarily be exposed to the risk of contracting COVID. So we're going to have, at the end of the three-week process, immigration will then go through its verification exercise. We have all original information stored on our databases, and that will be verified, it will check, it will be updated. And then immigration will begin contacting persons, asking them to now come in, bring their cards. When they bring their cards in, on the dates that they're requested to do it, or their ministerial permits, they will then be issued either with a new ministerial permit or a special security tag on your card that needs to be carried out. So that is the exercise after the verification, and that is why it's essential you place an up-to-date telephone number and email address so you can be con contacted to come in and get your, your new registration done and completed with a security-coded sticker or the issuance of a new ministerial permit. The forms will be filled out in English using block letters. All of this information will be available on our website. There would be a category of persons who, when the original registration took place, were under the age of 16. And you all would recall at the time the government said that persons under the age of 16 would not be issued with one of these migration registration cards. 
They would now have attained the age of 16 and over, so they will now be entitled to be issued with a card, so that is also going to be part of the process. I'd like to emphasize, just as we did when, this gov when the government announced this policy back in 2019, that none of this period of time can be calculated by any person who's registered towards attaining permanent residency or citizenship in Trinidad and Tobago. This is a purely humanitarian effort that was done to facilitate, and at the time we said any Venezuelan that was in Trinidad and Tobago, whether here legally or illegally, we came up with 16,500, a number of dropped off for the various reasons that I gave before. But those are the persons who are now, we're asking to come back in, update your information with us, and get new identification in the form of stickers on your cards or the issuance of new ministerial permits. These applications will be assessed by the immigration division, and once you're granted the extension, you will be contacted. How do you know when your new registration card is ready to be collected? Exactly as I said a short while ago, the immigration division will contact you and that's why your phone number or your email address is critical. How long will these cards be valid for? In the first instance, another six month period. And once again, coming to the end of that period, cabinet will take an active decision as to what it is we decide to do and what would be the policy with respect to of Venezuelans who have been registered under this process. So this re-registration scheme and verification of information, update of information, starts on Monday the 8th of March and will be completed in terms of the dropping off of your filled out forms in the sealed envelopes on the 26th of March. So it's a three week period. You must, if you're here and registered, come back and re-register provide the information. If you don't, you're going to be left out of the system. To the employers out there who are employing Venezuelans, the fact that they have their registration cards continues to give them the, the legal status that they need to work and to be here in Trinidad and Tobago, even though the dates on the cards may have expired on the face of it. Because as a government, we granted extensions up to this point in time. What we're asking now is for persons to come in and do this re-registration exercise. The Ministry of National Security, the other agencies in government, for example, the Ministry of Communication, and you, the members of the media, we're asking you all to help us between now, Monday, and the 26th, get this word out there. And I'm quite sure, having gone through the exercise afresh once before in 2019, the word spreads very, very quickly. So we expect all of those Venezuelans who are here and have this legal status to come in and to do what is necessary. We have formulated the Dropbox exercise to have minimum amount of human contact, but yet still allow immigration to do what needs to be done for the updating of records. So this information will be put up on our website. The information should be given to the members of the media as well as we go forward with this next stage of how we deal with those Venezuelans who were already registered back in 2019. That's what I've asked you all here today to, to get that message out. Your hand went up quick there for questions. Yes, I get Ryan Hamilton Davis, Davis uh, Trinidad Newsday. Um, I know you've mentioned this before, but just... Um, Can I hear no? Yeah? All right, yeah. Ryan Hamilton Davis, Trinidad Newsday. Um, I know you would have mentioned this before, but just for clarity at this point in time, um, the, the constant re the constant re registration every six months, uh, there have been questions of whether or not there could be another means to make it more of a streamlined process, uh, something longer than six months or, or something of that in, in the um, so thank you very much for that question. The answer is no. At this time, this is the government's policy. We're doing it in a six-month cycle. I don't predict the future. So it may be in the future we may take a different decision, but at this stage we still continue to maintain a six-month cycle is what we're going with. So this now is the largest re-registration we've done outside of the original registration. 
Uh, no, there is a process outside of the, the, the registration, the re-registration process and the registration process that happened in 2019 for permanent um, residents in Trinidad and Tobago. Have any of the Venezuelans that, are, that were registered under this um, taken, taken up that option? Well, they can't because, well, they may be able to, but no, I haven't seen any of those applications. But anyone who came in under this registration scheme, the time doesn't begin to run, nor do you fall into a category as a result of registering here. Mm -hmm. There may be independent circumstances outside of that. For example, we've seen a number of Venezuelans may go on to get married to Trinidadians. Here. They may then put in an application for permanent residency, but that too is a process, and it is not just because you apply your granted permanent residency. So there are some of those instances, but not any, any amount to talk about. Okay, um, as we are speaking, as you're speaking about uh, uh, extenuating circumstances, one question that, um, that was posed before, well, a couple of questions posed beforehand um, with, with regard to obtaining driver's licenses and uh, to the point where uh, a, a Venezuelan national registered would have had a child locally in Trinidad, uh, you know, over their, over their stay. Uh, there was there was uh, some back and forth over the weekend about it. Uh, you, you may have had to get some clarification on some of those points. Any other, any other Okay, that's there? a number of different issues that you've raised. Just the license and, start... the, and the children. Okay, so that's two different issues. So first on the can persons who have registered, can Venezuelans who've registered under this scheme apply for driver's permits in Trinidad and Tobago? That has to be directed to the Ministry of Works and Transport. I have to admit that I don't have that information at hand. So that is one of the things I'll ask that we, we can, can look at, get the answer from Ministry of Works and Transport, and in particular the Transport Commissioner, and put that up on the, the frequently asked questions on our website. With respect to children who are born here during the period, because that's normal and, and a natural course, they are Trinidadians, because persons born here the same way we have Trinidadians, well, Trinidadian parents who go and they have their children abroad and their children are now United States citizens, British citizens. It's the same thing. So anyone born in Trinidad is a Trinidadian citizen. But what about the parents? Well, it doesn't affect the parents, right? They are Trinidadian citizens. The same way you and your wife may decide to go and have a child in the United States. It doesn't give you now, your child may be a United States citizen, but it doesn't give you any right of citizenship and that is how it is in most countries of the world and one off-topic question concerning our immigration officers we have 13 um from my last check 13 testing positive and about 84 some somewhere around there immigration officers decided to go into quarantine i just want to get an update as to how they're doing what is their status and uh, you know and so on i believe one was might have been hospitalized as well What's your condition? All right. First of all, this whole episode of immigration officers, it is a normal course of what the country, the world has been dealing with during the pandemic in the last year. There are certain health protocols. So when you work in an office environment, and we have faced this throughout the public service for the last year, when a person tests positive, you do contact tracing. One of the suge suggested health protocols is a person Persons who are in close contact with the person who has tested positive, what you call primary contacts, that they then go on quarantine to get them out. Sanitization would um, take place in the areas where the positive person would have, have been. And, and by and large, certainly my experience in the public service, we just sanitize all of the areas. So that took place here. What, is, what happened is unfortunate. So, so far, I don't know if there has been any further update, 13 officers tested positive. I believe a couple have been hospitalized and I hope and wish for a speedy recovery on their behalves. And then the persons they would have been in contact with the various shifts, they are now in quarantine as well and hopefully not presenting signs of any symptoms. Good afternoon, Minister Young, Bobita Gopalchan from CNC3 News. I have two questions, one on this topic. Um, if you could just provide an estimated number of the amount of registrations that were cancelled. I'm trying, I was trying to remember that. I, I don't want to give inaccurate information. There were a number that never made it. 
So whilst they came in, they registered, etc. when we're doing verification of ex the verification exercise, originally they may have used false documents, etc. So they would not have been registered. There were also some within recent times. So I personally have cancelled, I would say under, just under about 50 registration cards in the past few weeks. And in particular, when we were doing the deportation exercises recently. Because remember, also persons who may be registered, that gives them legal status here. But if they then go and try and bring persons in illegally, the borders of Venezuela are closed, our borders are closed. So that's a breach of law that attract criminal sanction, the criminal offenses to, to enter our border without permission. Also, you're required to have a visa. So if you come in without a visa, that's another breach. Then also you've arrived without permission. So that's also a breach of our Immigration Act. Those are criminal offenses. And what we say is, well, you've aided and abetted persons in committing criminal offenses. So of course, from day one, we always made it clear that this isn't a get out of jail card or an immunity from prosecution card. If you've engaged in criminal activity, we've had a number of persons, unfortunately, who engaged in criminal activity and were charged, not only with respect to human smuggling or, or trafficking, and their cards have been canceled. Would you be able to provide that um, um, number to um, today? If, if we, I can't provide it today, but yes, at some time later we can provide it. There is the view that uh, the situation in Venezuela is improving. Are you seeing more Venezuelans looking to leave? Actually, I mean, it, we have had a number of exercises recently. There was one last week that fortunately, within a 24-hour period, we were able to get a sanctioned aircraft permission for the Venezuelan government to use a sanctioned aircraft as for, to receive it. That was completely independent of the government of Trinidad and Tobago. So the answer to your question is yes. That flight, every Venezuelan on that flight was as a result of the Venezuelan government offering them a repatriation, they decided to leave. So I think that's a good sign. Prior to that, in some of the repatriation and deportation exercises we had, there was a mixture. So we also had over 100 Venezuelans previously asked to leave and they were able to be facilitated first by our Coast Guard and then by the Venezuelan Navy or the Guardia Nacional to get back home to Venezuela. So there are situations like that. Also, I have seen and I've signed files coming across my desk with persons who have asked to leave and um, obviously they were granted permission to leave. And my final question is off topic. Um, any updates on the regulation for pepper spray use? That, that is a question I was asking myself today. The Attorney General is working on the necessary cabinet note for it to come to cabinet. As you all know, the National Security Council took a policy decision that we're going to allow the use of pepper spray. The Attorney General then has to prepare a cabinet note on the particular legislation or the amendments to the legislation, bring it to cabinet. So I don't know if it will come before us this week or hopefully next week. Good afternoon, Minister Young. Maybe earlier, Joseph Horton, TTT News. Um, how long do you see this re-registration process lasting after the March 26 deadline? How long will it take to turn around and, and get the, the yeah. persons verified, etc.? I asked immigration that. They are hoping to start the process of bringing persons back in to put the security stickers on their cards or issue new permits within a, a matter of weeks. It's, they did not forecast a very long time because remember we have everything computerized and on our system so it is literally a verification and updating exercise so they're hoping to begin to start i believe what it was four weeks or less than four weeks and start that turnaround process of getting the first set of people coming in Good afternoon, Minister Urvishi okay. from TV6. Um, so the 2019 Venezuelan registration process, among other objectives, it would have been intended to count the number of Venezuelans in TNT at that point in time to get that accurate figure, because I'm sure you would remember there were all other organizations banding about other figures. Since then, as you mentioned, many have left and some also would have entered. What is being done to get an accurate count on how many Venezuelans there are in TNT, both and illegal? All right, so as you rightly recall, this was an opportunity to get an accurate number of the amount of Venezuelans. We said whether you're here legally or illegally, 
come and register. If you don't, you're subject to our laws and you can de be deported immediately thereafter. So we, the government, think that is an accurate figure, fairly accurate figure for that point in time. At the time, unfortunately, a couple of years before, you had the UN suggesting 40,000 um, certain other people, the opposition in particular, you would hear them in sentence after sentence go from 40 to 60 to 100,000. I saw that being bandied about recently. We know that the 16 plus thousand Venezuelans registered here legally in Trinidad. There would have been more who came in via visa thereafter, who have permission, some come in via work permits. Those are the legal routes. It is difficult to provide a figure as to how many are here illegally until they meet the system. So until they're picked up, until they come in to try and regularize, etc. I do know it will be over 16,000 by definition, by logic, but I don't know what is the exact figure, nor am I going to get into speculation as to what is the exact figure. Would you have a figure on the number of Venezuelans sent back to Venezuela since we started re the registration in 2019? It would be in the hundreds, because just in the last six months, my recollection is we are close to well, over 250, and, and that does not include the flight last week. This would be excluding the, the boatloads that would have just been returned by Coast Guard and those who would have been quarantined at the heliport, etc. These hundreds would include those numbers? The boatloads that you say returned by Coast Guard, if the Coast Guard intercepts vessels coming across and they tell them don't come into our maritime space, that is not included. What, what I, the figures I just gave you are those who we would have picked up, we would have intercepted on land in Trinidad and Tobago during the pandemic, built out a facility at the heliport to make sure everyone's kept safely, and those who were repatriated or deported from them. Those are the numbers I'm talking about. Okay. And that's just within the last few months. Minister, given that um, we're seeing counterparts in health saying that the COVID vaccine once received um, in Trinidad can be given to anyone within the jurisdiction. Um, of course, the question was posed to the Prime Minister, how does the government intend to do that distribute to migrants? My question to you is, do you anticipate an influx of migrants, persons who will come here specifically for the vaccine? No. Okay. Um, have you any idea of the immigration turnout today, given that PSA President Watson Duke would have also called on other parties to support his shutdown? Well, I was hoping that you all would give me an update on, on what, if anybody thinks that Watson Duke is relevant and listen to him. Certainly the two permanent secretaries here at the Ministry of National Security, after meeting with me, met with the acting chief immigration officer yesterday. A release was put out to that effect. And we were given an assurance that immigration immigration officers are very responsible by and large. I have not had any reports of there being any downing of tools. And here we are at the end of the working day. And um, sense and sensibility continues to prevail in Trinidad and Tobago. Well, it's interesting that you would say the officers are responsible by and large because there was this article on the front page of the Express today, Valentine COVID. Now, whereas the government's messaging has been against social gatherings and practicing safety and certain pre health protocols, precautions, while in certain settings, we're seeing allegations here that essential employees, immigration officers, may have engaged in such activities and deviate from what is being recommended by government. Um, to the detriment, some say, of national security. Do you have any thoughts on this? Well, first of all, like you, I woke up to the page of the Express today and was quite taken aback by what I saw on the front of the Express and what I read and what apparently exists on social media. Um, I had alluded to the fact that we were hearing certain things that, and I, I know the numbers of when you all see who was tested positive and stuff. So we know the numbers of persons coming through the airport and who coming through the airport has eventually tested positive and how low those numbers may be. So I was quite taken aback by what I saw. But at the end of the day, as we've said consistently, everybody is responsible for their own behavior in this. And as a government, we can only put in place regulations. We can only ask everybody to be responsible. And we have seen sometimes irresponsible behavior by people 
I've heard the Minister of Health, the CMO, their team talk about people becoming complacent. We had to eventually make the wearing of masks mandatory. I think by and large that has worked fairly well in Trinidad and Tobago and that is a big factor in the government's response to COVID-19 and has helped us, I think, from what the health experts tell us, keep our numbers of positive cases down. I can just ask that all of our officers in the public service, like everybody else, including in private sector, continue to listen to the suggestions of health and follow the regulations and not engage in activity in particular without your mask and lack of social distancing, etc. Because if that is where it came from, it shows you how very quickly what you think having a good time can spread into a super spreader event. Do you think there ought to be any targeted messaging towards particularly government employees, essential employees, or probably positive reinforcement or giving them something for abiding by no, this? No, because I think generally, as I just said, it's up to everybody to remain focused, up to everybody to follow the health protocols. And government, government employees are just normal citizens like the rest of us. And from what I have seen, the vast majority are doing what they have to do. We haven't seen um, spikes in government offices and this type of thing. But unfortunately, if there are events such as that, sometimes it could lead to a super spreader event and it's not confined alone to government employees. Okay? That's one minister. You, you may I know you normally can't resist. Go on. <laughs> you made a clear call for people to come in and re-register. Yes. But you didn't make a really make a call for the legals to come forward? What, what is the reason why I didn't really make that call for them to... To make the illegals to come forward on this occasion? Well, on any occasion. Well, I mean, it's not for me to tell people who've engaged in illegal activity come forward, let me deport you. But what I can say is that we do have exercises ongoing and that have been consistently ongoing. And um, you all have seen, I don't want to say too much more because you've seen some of the challenges taken place in the court over the last few months. Certainly the government's position is, and national security's position is, if you're in breach of the law, we will enforce the law. All right? Thank you all, all very much. Continue to stay safe.